very nice. All right, we have been going through a kind of a little mini series uh, of passages all Christians should know. And the first one we looked at was Glow, uh, just a passage in John, First John, that reminds us that this is the truth, that God is light and there is no darkness at all in him. And if we are in the light as he is in the light, then we have that relationship not just with him, but also with one another as fellow Christians. And then we know when we are in the light, we are a light. And then we can go out and we can glow in this world and people can see our good works and then glorify who? Our Father which is in heaven from Matthew, right? So it's kind of this, this ability to be in the light uh, as God is light helps our relationship with him, our relationship with one another, and then helps the world have a relationship with God as well. So how important is that? <laughs> that we be in the light and not be walking in darkness as the world does. And that's the choice we have. And we need to make those good choices every day to walk in God's light. Also, last week we saw the word grow um, from 2 Peter. Uh, we went and looked how we, of course, start with faith. That's where it has to start. Faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior uh, for salvation, which creates that initial important relationship with God and that eternal salvation we have. But that shouldn't be where it ends. Uh, for salvation, that, that's it. But as we go through this life, we still got a lot of work to do, and we need to grow in our relationship with him and add to that faith things like virtue and then add to the virtue and just keep going down the list until we get to where we have the same kind of love, agape love, that God has for those around us. And we need to keep seeking that growth it's going to be you know three steps forward two steps back four steps forward one step back it's going to be that way some steps sometimes one two back three back <laughs> but we need to keep then turning around giving it to the lord and then keep moving forward and growing in our walk with him and then tonight we're going with the third word and that is we need to what go so we need to glow, we need to grow, we also need to go. In fact, it's interesting to me, I like patterns. And whenever Jesus, in fact, really the last words that Jesus talked on this earth with his disciples all had to do with this word, go. <laughs> this is what he wanted them to do as he had those opportunities, be it in the upper room when he came in and they were all there, whether it was in Galilee or whether it was on the Mount of Olives, as he was talking to them, as we will see from all of the Gospels, including the book of Acts, we will see that his instructions to them, as they are instructions to us, is to go. Our job is to go out into the world, not be of the world, not to walk in darkness as the world does, not to be like the world, but we do need to go out into the world. And when we go out into this world, there are certain things we need to go and do. Okay? So let's take a look at those tonight. Actually, we'll be looking at four passages tonight. We will look at all our instructions to go, and then we'll see the how and why of it. Again, from those same passages. So let's all go to Matthew chapter 28. Anybody know what this passage is commonly referred to as? Uh, the Great Commission. The Great Commission to do what? Go. <laughs> Go. Go. That's what Jesus told them. In fact, we'll back it up to verse 16 so we get some context. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Now, if you remember, initially they were all supposed to go back into Jerusalem. They were down there, but they were instructed to go to Galilee after his resurrection. But, of course, they didn't go. He had to come to them a couple of times, remind them. <laughs> so eventually they did go, and they went up into Galilee where Jesus could spend some time with them. And then they came back uh, to Jerusalem. And then they went up to the Mount of Olives, and that's where Jesus ascended. But here they are in Galilee. 
Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That is still, <laughs> that's a head scratcher, isn't it? At some point, when do you stop doubting? Uh, they had seen him now at least twice, some of them even more than that. And uh, here we have them still kind of wondering what's going on. Uh, what's the purpose of this? What does he want? Uh, is this really him? Uh, maybe with some of their doubts. And in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Do what, therefore? Go and teach all nations. So, The instruction he gives them here is to go teach. Teach who? All nations. Go and teach everybody, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So we need to, one of our jobs is to go and teach this world. And this is so important. Um, some of us, uh, some Christians, uh, tend to rather just judge. <laughs> They'd rather just to tell people they're doing things wrong. Uh, would rather just kind of run them down because they're not doing this right or not doing that right. That is not our job. What is our job? We need to go and do what? Teach. Teach assumes that they don't know better, doesn't it? It assumes that they don't know, and that's what we need to make sure we have in our mind. As we go out into this world, you have to assume that since they are not Christians, that they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, do they really even know who God is? Do they even know how to do what is right? Do they even know how to please God? Do they even know how to live a life that is good? And the answer is what? No, <laughs> they don't, and therefore they need somebody to do what? Teach them. And that's the attitude we must have, not one of judgment. I mean, it'd be like, you know, next week, school is starting. Can you imagine a teacher just starting the first day of class, third graders, and just lighten into them and say, I can't believe you guys are so stupid, so ignorant, not to know how to do this, not how to do this, not how to do this. I'm done with you. You guys are just a bunch of fools, and I don't want to waste my time on you. What would you say that was? A terrible teacher. <laughs> Instead, what is the attitude of a teacher? If you don't know, it is my job to teach you by any means possible. I need to meet you where, in fact, that's what good teachers do. They don't just follow some scheme <laughs> that somebody else them. They actually work with each individual, and they try to figure out, how does this pe person learn? How can they know this material? How best do they absorb it? And that's what we need to do. It's one thing just to go around telling people. Verbal is one way, isn't it? Is that the only way? No, there's also examples, <laughs> right? Can we be a good example to this world? In fact, if we're glowing and we're growing like we're supposed to be doing, that's when we can be a good example, isn't it? Of how to do it right. And some people learn better that way, don't they? And some people learn by example. Some even learn by making mistakes, <laughs> don't they? Don't run people down when they make mistakes. Use that as a what moment? Teaching moment, right? We're teachers, people. In fact, as Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, you as a pastor need to make sure you go out into this world and you teach them with patience and humility, right? You need to be patient with them. You need to care about them. You need to have humility. Why do we know these things? Because we're smarter than they are? Or is it because God has revealed these things to us? God taught us. And somebody else taught us, right? 
Why does the teacher know how to do everything that they are teaching? Because they, when, they, when they were born, they just knew this stuff, right? No, somebody taught them, right? And experience and things like that taught them. And we need to have the same attitude. We need to go and teach. Who? All nations. What are we to teach? Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Teach them. What has God commanded us to do? What has God told us that is right? What is good? Who he is? Who we are? Teach them about sin. Teach them the consequences of sin. But more importantly, also teach them what? How to do right, right? Remember we learned about the scripture? What's the scripture good for? Doctrine, which is what? Teachings and reproof and what? Correction and instruction in righteousness. We need to teach those things, don't we? We need to teach them the Word of God. Don't assume that they should know it. These are the United States. They should know this. They should know what's right. Did you? <laughs> Did you always know what was right? <laughs> that's the humility part, isn't it? We need to teach them. Teach them what we have learned. And again, that's all he's saying. Teach them what you've learned. I always like that about all of these. He doesn't go and say, teach them things you've never heard of before. Teach them things you don't know. <laughs> teach them things, the high things and the great things. Go teach them, you know, physics. What does he say? Teach them what you've been taught. Have you been taught something? If you've been taught something, then you can what? Teach it. <laughs> so go and teach all nations. Teach them the things that you have been taught. Okay? So that's number one. You guys ready to go to number two? Let's go. Mark, let's go to the next book. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 15. Now, when this occurred is debatable. The verse right before it talks about how Jesus came and upbraided them. At when they were sitting down to eat in the upper room uh, for their lack of belief, uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that he then said this. Could, could have been there. Uh, could have been other places, but we're just going to take it, he said this. <laughs> he said this to them in verse 15. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and do what? Preach. Not only are we to teach with patience and humility, teach them, bring them along by example and by word. Uh, we need to keep going and teaching, but we also do need to preach. We need to preach what? Preach the gospel. And what is the gospel? How many here know the gospel? Pretty simple. <laughs> what? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? What's the penalty for sin? Death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be, what? Saved. We're all sinners. We all deserve punishment for our sin. But Jesus died for those sins. And if we simply have faith and ask him to forgive us, he will. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And then we have what? Eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That you know the gospel, right? Again, this isn't anything you don't know. It's something you put your faith in. It's something that you know to be true. And we are supposed to go and preach that. Tell people the gospel. Verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So is this important? This is kind of important, isn't it? If people don't do what you teach them to do, about right and wrong and righteousness and things like that, they may make their life miserable, but if they do not believe the gospel, <laughs> then what? Uh, they're in real big trouble, aren't they? So we need to preach the gospel, because if they believe, then they're saved. But if they're not, they will receive the punishment that we all deserve. 
And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And he says, when this message goes out, people will know it's the truth by these signs, right? So people will know this is not a new gospel. This is not something really new. It's just that this is the accomplishment of the gospel. That Jesus Christ has come and has died. And you put your faith in him and his work on the cross, then you are saved, right? And this is what people need to know. And we need to go and preach. We need to tell people this. And again, with what kind of attitude? Like teaching is with a patience and a humility. The preaching has to be with love, doesn't it? A caring about the other person. We need to realize, who out there did Jesus Christ die for? Every single one of them. Who out there does God want to believe in Jesus Christ and be his child and be saved for eternity. Everybody. So we need to make sure we're doing that. That we go in where? All the world. To everybody. Make sure everybody knows this. Again, it's not our responsibility to save anybody, but it is our responsibility to go and preach. To tell them the truth. In love, right? Speak the truth in love. This is the truth. We're all sinners. We're not... We're not better than they are. We all are. All deserve eternal condemnation for our sin. But Jesus Christ died for us. And if you just put your faith in him, you will be saved. That's God's promise, isn't it? And we need to go and preach the gospel. And not more than the gospel, not less than the gospel. Right? Don't take any away from it. Don't add anything to it. Just preach the gospel which we know, right, to be true. So we need to go teach what we have learned about right and wrong, who God is, all those things that we have learned. And we also need to go and preach the gospel, right? We also need to go in Luke chapter 24. Let's go to the next one. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 46. Luke chapter 24, verse 46. And Jesus said to them, the disciples, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Okay? We know this. We, in fact, we just heard that in the book of Mark, right? He told them, go and preach. And this is what was intended, starting with Jerusalem, and then as we know in Acts chapter 1, it starts in Jerusalem and then goes where? To Judea and to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world, right? This is the method it's going to go out unto the whole world so the whole world will know. Also, verse 48, and you are what? Witnesses of these things. So we need to go and preach, but we also need to go and... What do witnesses do? Say what they've seen and heard. You testify, right? And that in our, in our society, and that we're witness, you would find a witness is on the stand, right? Tell us what you saw. Tell us what you know. Tell us of what you know about this person, right? We need to go and we need to testify. In fact, let's run over to Acts chapter 1. Because this really expounds on really the same thing he's saying. And by the way, same writer, right? Everybody knows that. <laughs> uh, Luke is the writer of Acts. So he's really kind of ex expounding on it here. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So that's not our job, by the way. Our job is not to try to figure out when Jesus is coming and come up with a date and a time. It's not our job to worry about it is it either, is it? Or to look around constantly saying, oh, is it now? Is it now? Is it going to be this week? Is it going to be next month? It doesn't matter. It matters in the large scheme of things, but it doesn't matter to our job, does it? It doesn't impact our job at all because our job is to what? Verse 8. But you shall have power. 
After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. They are to be witnesses. We are to be witnesses. We need to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. In other words, wherever we go, right? Be it your little community right here around you, to the adjoining community, to the next community over, to the whole world wherever you go, we should go and whatever we do, how we interact with other people, we should always be witnesses. We should always be testifying of God. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it could be as simple as letting people know what God has done for you. Giving God credit, glorifying Him in all things, right? It could be simply at work, letting people know that you are a what? A Christian. When somebody says, how was your weekend? What's a good thing to mention? If you went to church, let them know. Hey, church was good. <laughs> this is what we talked about. I mean, it's part of your life, isn't it? And that's how we're witnesses. God is a part of our life. We should be able to testify of what he is doing in our life, giving him credit for what's going on in our life, letting people what we know about him from his word, things we have learned about him, and just being a good testimony too, right? Uh, and the way we act, the way we interact. We've been studying that on Sunday morning, haven't we? With Elijah and Elisha, simply by the way they reacted to different situations, they testified to the greatness of God, didn't they? To his power and the peace that they had in him. And we can just shine in that way and testify. Go and testify as witnesses of God. And then finally, John chapter 21. So go back probably one or two pages if you're in Acts 1. And yes, John also has a little episode here that reminds us of something. And this is the interaction between Peter and Jesus in Galilee. Now, Peter and the disciples, they did finally go to Galilee, and they were sitting around, and nothing was happening, so they decided to go fishing, right? That's what most of them did for a living. It's kind of their old stomping grounds, so they decided to go fishing. Uh, Jesus shows up on the shore, tells them to cast their net on the other side. When they had caught nothing on all night, he says, cast them on the other side. They caught many fish. Peter was like, oh, this happened before. <laughs> He jumps out of the boat, swims to him. Jesus already has food all ready on, over the fire, everything ready to go. But something's eating at Peter. What did Peter do the night that Jesus was arrested? Denied him three times. Three times he was asked. Three times he was approached. Was he a good testimony? <laughs> did he testify? <laughs> no, he did not testify. Instead, he lied and said, I have no idea who that even swore. I've never met this man. I have no idea what you're talking about. And that's kind of in the back of his mind. By the way, does God know what's in the back of your mind? He knows what's in the back of your mind, front of your mind, side of your mind. He knows what's on your mind three weeks from now. <laughs> so he knows it all. So Jesus pulls him aside, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Jesus said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him a third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto the Lord, Thou knowest all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said unto him, What? Feed my sheep. In other words, go do your go do your job. Right? It doesn't matter the mistakes that we have made. It doesn't matter what has happened in the past. God has a job for us to do, doesn't he? He has work for us to do. 
to go teach, preach, and testify. But it's also other things, ministering to one another, being one one. There's so many things that God has for us. What was Peter's job? To go and feed the lambs and feed the sheep. He was going to be a leader in the early church. He was going to go and preach and teach and open up the gospel to those in Jerusalem being preaching on that first day of Pentecost, going to Judea and opening it up there, going to Samaria and opening it up there. He had the keys to the kingdom. He had a job to do, and we sometimes we can't do our job if all we're thinking about, oh, all the time we wasted. Ever, you ever felt about that one? All the times I could have been doing something. All the times I, I didn't do it. All the times I didn't say anything. All the times I didn't do the work. God can't use me. What's God's answer to that, by the way? Oh, yeah, he can. <laughs> of course he can. Right? Oh, I've made too many mistakes. I, I've done too many wrong things. I've said the wrong things. I've done the wrong things. I've walked away from the Lord. I've backslidden before in my life. I've made this mistake or that. God can't use me. What does God say to that? Yeah, sure I can. No problem. Who, who, who did God use? Paul, Samson, Gideon. <laughs> who can God use? God used a donkey. Come on, people. God can use us. He has a job for us to do, and we need to go and do what? Go do your job. That's all he's saying to Peter. Just go and do your job. It's going to be fine. In fact, he notes that uh, later on, in his life, he is going to be challenged again. He's going to be threatened with death because of his belief in Jesus Christ. And at that point, he is going to give his life. <laughs> kind of a little bit of reassurance there. It's going to be okay. In the end, it's, yeah, you will. There's going to be ups and downs. Are we going to fail sometimes in, in our job? The answer is yes, by the way. <laughs> So if you're putting off the job until you know you're going to get 100% right, there's no such thing. Go and do your job. And if you make a mistake, get right with God and then go and do your job. Because, and he says it there, why should we? Because we what? That's enough, isn't it? <laughs> to do, to go and teach what we have learned from God, to preach the gospel of God, to testify of God, to do our job that God is. What does he say to Peter there? Do you love me? If you love me, Peter, that's enough. <laughs> to go and do your job. If you love me, it's good enough to go preach. It's, if you love me, it's good enough to go teach. If you love me, it's enough. Plus, Do we love others enough to do this? Remember what it said? Anybody who believes the gospel will be saved. But anybody who does not believe the gospel will be condemned. In fact, they're condemned already, aren't they? Do we care enough? Do we love others enough? Do we love the people in our family enough? Do we love our friends enough? Do we love our coworkers enough? Do we love the world around us enough? To say, I'm going to go teach, preach, and testify. I'm going to do my job. Because I love my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I love my neighbor. I even love my enemy. <laughs> I love them enough to do, go, and do these things. And again, what is he really asking us to do? Teach things we know. Preach a gospel we already know. Testify to what we already know. And do a job that he gives us and gives us every single ability to do it. So is he asking too much for us? <laughs> He's not asking for you to you know, solve uh, you know, all the problems of the world. He's just asking us to go do these things, right? How can we possibly do it? Well, you may have noticed a theme in here. In fact, let's go look at him again. Let's go back to Matthew again. How can we possibly do this? Well, we can't on our own, can we? We don't have this kind of power to really impact the world around us. But who does? 
Notice what he says in Matthew 28. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. So who has all the power? By the way, it's not the people you're telling it to. <laughs> it's not whatever they believe in. It, they don't have the power. Who has all the power? God has all the power. And then what, look what it says at the, beginning, at the end of verse 20. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So the one who has all the power is with who? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus is going to be with us every step of the way. Does that sound good? But wait. There's more. Mark. Chapter 16. Verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. God's power is on us, isn't it? Now, he gave them amazing miracles and things to do. Is God still working in this world? Does God still give us the power to go and make an impact in the world around us? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we need to know that. Because who's with us? Jesus is with us, but who else? Acts chapter 1. Let's not forget this. Verse 8. But you shall receive power after that who has come upon you. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is on us, isn't it? And he will give us what? Power. In fact, you know, the devil's pretty good at his job. I don't know if you noticed this. But when we have that kind of push, you really ought to go talk to that person. You really should teach that person. What's one of the first things that will come to our head? I don't know what to say, right? I don't know how to convince them. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. I, I can't. Sounds like Moses, doesn't it? But who's with you? Jesus. And who is in you? In fact, what did Jesus tell his disciples? When you get up in front of councils and Sadducees and Pharisees and all these guys, all these guys with degrees and wearing the big robes and know all the big words, and you're just a little fisherman, don't even practice what you're going to say. Don't even think about what you're going to say. We know what we know, don't we? We know the gospel. We know what we know. We, we know who God is. We know what he's done for us. The Holy Spirit is in us. He will give us the words to say. In fact, with Peter and John and these guys, these fishermen from Galilee, as they stood in front of the Sanhedrin, what was the remark of them after they spoke? How do these guys get so smart? <laughs> how do these guys, how do these backward fishermen from Galilee know so much? Well, who, who was with them? Who can give us the right things to say? The right things that can convince somebody? I can tell you right now, because I know a lot of Christians will sit there and say, well, I want to make sure i got to plan this out. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to say this, and then, you know, then they're going to say this, and then I'll be able to come back with this, and then oh, it's going to be great. I've got, I've got my arguments down. I've got everything. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, there, there, there's no formula. There's no, well, I've got to say this first, and I've got to say this first, and I've got to get them to say this. No. Just let them know what you know, and the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say, right? Because the Holy Spirit's on you. He'll give you the right timing. He'll give you the opportunities. He will get, he's the one that will actually convince them. He's the one that actually will convict them. He's the one that actually will bring them to Jesus. Our job is just to go and what? Go teach, go preach, go testify, and go do our job, whatever it is, right? That's our job. That's what we're called to do by Jesus. And who has the power? So well, Jesus got all the power, and he's with us every step of the way. Who gives us power? Holy Spirit. And he's with us all the way, isn't he? And why should we? Well, because we love God. And that's enough. Enough motivation there, isn't it? But also we love others.
enough to be patient with them, enough to teach them and bring them along and tell them the truth. So that is what we need to go and do. From the four Gospels, from Jesus himself, and that's, I guess, that's the other question. I mean, who's telling us to do this? It's Jesus, so... <laughs> it's, it's, you know... Uh, Somebody comes up, just tells you to do something. He maybe may or may not should do it. But when God comes and tells you you need to do it, there's a reason behind it, isn't it? And he will, uh, he will be with us all the step of the way. So any thoughts or questions? Now, I want to remind you, who is he saying this to? He was saying this to 11 very scared men <laughs> with very little formal education very little influence in their society if any at all men who were fishermen and tax collectors and <laughs> they, these had no power of themselves nothing big and they had been trained for a whopping three and a half years now I know their teacher was the best of all time but still <laughs> How many of us have been learning these things a lot longer? <laughs> so, um, and we have, of course, the advantage of having the entire scriptures, right? We have the advantage of having the Holy Spirit on us the whole way, right? So, if these 11 guys could go and impact the world by just simply going, we need to do the same thing. Now, don't make the mistake. When Jesus actually went up in the air, what did they spend time doing? Looking up in the air. Don't look up in the air. Don't keep looking for him coming, looking for his coming, looking for his coming. Just go and do your job, right? God will come when he's supposed to come, right? Go teach. Go preach. Go testify. Go do your job. Right? Any other thoughts or questions? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father,